From CBS 2 News, this is a special report. As I mentioned, we're, unless there's a very meaningful material development, in which case we'll change plans, tomorrow will be uh, an email uh, paper release in terms of the overnight uh, numbers and, and any other news that we have to report. Because of a White House VTC on Monday, we'll do the press conference at 2 o'clock instead of our usual uh, 1 o'clock time uh, frame here. So I'm honored to be joined today, uh, as I am every day, uh, by the woman to my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. <laughs> to her right, an another name that is well known uh, to most folks in the state, state epidemiologist, Dr. Christina Tan. Great to have the two of you here with us. To my far left, another familiar face, State Police Superintendent, Colonel Pat Callahan. And to my immediate left, uh, representing the Department of Labor and Workforce Development, Commissioner Rob Acero Angelo. I mentioned, I think, yesterday that I asked Rob to give us an update on the Department of Labor's efforts to ensure that every New Jerseyan in need of unemployment insurance relief is able to file their claim and receive their benefits. The folks in Rob's department are dealing with an unprecedented crush of people trying to reach them. We understand that it can get frustrating. We do uh, when the UI website gets bogged down or if you're stuck on a hold on the telephone, but also know that these people are working harder than ever while also worrying about their own families. So I've asked Rob, and I thank you, Rob, for doing it to help us understand a little bit better his team's efforts and where we go from here. So thank you. Um, and so, as we have been doing of late, let's get to the numbers uh, early uh, in our discussion, and they're particularly sobering today. Since yesterday, we have been notified that another 4,331, that's 4,331 residents, have tested positive for coronavirus. That brings our statewide total to 34,124. Again, 4,331 overnight positive tests for a total of 34,124. As usual, Judy will give you more color. In addition, with the heaviest of hearts, we are today reporting that another 200 residents have passed due to COVID-19 related complications. Our state total now sits at 846 precious lives lost. Let me put this in a proper yet very sobering context. We have now lost nearly 100 more of our fellow New Jerseyans to COVID-19 than we did on the September 11th attacks. Please let that sink in for a moment. This pandemic is writing one of the greatest tragedies in our state's history. And just as we have committed to never forgetting those lost on 9-11, we must commit to never forgetting those we are losing to this pandemic. We won't do this every day, and we certainly won't do it often, even though those numbers will continue to climb. But I'm going to pause right now for a moment of silence. Allow me to mention some of those, a uh, very few, sadly, of the many we've lost, the precious lives we've lost. Retired Colonel Samuel Fuco of Eatontown in my home county. And there's Samuel, one of our recent Memorial Days, with me admiring one of the wreaths that were placed in honor of our fallen veterans. And Sam has now fallen himself. From Eatontown, he served our nation in the Army and Army Reserves for more than 37 years. He was awarded the Bronze Medal for his service in Iraq in 2006 and 2007, and he also received the New Jersey Distinguished Service Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster. He also led the Monmouth Chapter of the Association of the United States Army. Our state lost him yesterday. We thank him for his life of service, as we do every single one of our proud veterans 
his memory and his family are in our prayers. I want to thank my friend Vin Gopal to making sure that I knew, sadly, uh, the minute he knew that we had lost Sam. Another one, Jesus Villalus was a patient transport worker at Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, where he had worked for, new, for 27 years. His co-workers remembered the time that he won the 50-50 raffle, and instead of keeping it for himself, he shared it with his colleagues. He was 75 years old, and we joined his family and everyone he touched in mourning his passing. Teaneck, which has been particularly hard hit, lost another great member of its community, Perry Rosenstein. Perry was the uncle, there's Perry, I love the hat. Perry was the uncle of CWA New Jersey director, Hetty Rosenstein, who so many of us here in Trenton know so well. Perry founded both the Puffin Foundation in Teaneck to support the arts and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade archives to chronicle the American fighters who stood against Spanish fascism during the Franco regime, regime, among so much more. All of us send our condolences to Hetty and the entire Rosenstein family and the friends and fellow Teaneckers who Perry touched. And I learned last night that a dear friend uh, in Morris County, my dear friend Scott Carlson, lost his dad, Gerald, who was going to turn 88 in two weeks. He was a lifelong New Jerseyan. He was a lifelong design draftsman. He worked on both the shuttle Columbia and Challenger. Uh, we're keeping Scott and his family and his dad's memory in our prayers this weekend. He was the proud grandfather of Haley and Evan. So to each and every one of them and the many, many more who we are not mentioning by name today, God rest their souls. Today, as I mentioned yesterday, our flags are flying at half staff in their memories and in the memory of all who have been lost and for all the families who have been impacted by COVID-19 and are not, we have to remind everyone, are not able to fully gather properly for a funeral or a memorial. And the flags will continue to fly at half staff throughout the duration of this pandemic. No family, whether in New Jersey or anywhere, will be forgotten. I know that staying apart is really hard, whether it be for a funeral or a religious rite that we long to attend. But right now we have no choice. It's what we need to do. It is what we must do. I spoke yesterday by telephone with a, a, a great leader in our state, Cardinal Joe Tobin. The Cardinal made it clear that everyone needs to stay home, including, and I say this, and I know he says this with, with profound gravity, including not taking communion, whether it's tomorrow for Palm Sunday uh, or any day. And I know it's not easy for him or Catholics around the state, uh, as this especially is the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, so to all our Christian brothers and sisters, uh, we acknowledge the beginning of the week tomorrow, but we plead with you to stay home and stay away from each other. Cardinal Tobin then spoke uh, as he volunteered to do with each of the archbishops in this state. And while I'm mentioning him, and that was the conversation I had, I know he speaks for all. I know he speaks for, uh, he spoke with, and, and I want to give a particular shout out to my bishop from the Archdiocese of Trenton right here, Bishop O'Connell. I thank not just the Catholic leadership, but leaders across all of our faith communities who are coming together to help meet the spiritual needs of their congregations while also ensuring the social distancing that is so critical to flattening the curve and getting us through this emergency, especially in this season. When you've got, as I mentioned, Holy Week leading up to Easter, you've got Passover starting on Wednesday and not too far behind Ramadan to pick three big religious holidays among so many other celebrations and festivals that are fast approaching. Our desire clearly is to come together. That's only natural. We are humans, but our need and our mandate is to find a way to observe and celebrate separately. I know it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that we are more than up to meeting. Keep practicing your social distancing. As we note in this map, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come to it in a second, uh, consider it, as Father Jim would say, social solidarity. By being apart, we're actually working together. 
And this graphic from the New York Times shows the impact it shows on how vital social distancing is to slow the spread. Let's stay with this just for a second, Mahan. The, um, this is color coded for all 21 counties. And by the way, there's no amount of uh, football spiking that we should attach to this graph, but it gives you some sense. And this has changed meaningfully over the past several days. And on the margin, that's a good thing. Uh, the darker colors are where the uh, amount of folks who are infected is, is doubling at a faster rate. And so while the cases in Salem and Cape May County to pick two in the south are quite low, I think, Judy, total positives in Cape May are 50 and in Salem County, 25. So between them, only 25 positive cases that have been tested, by the way. Again, that's just folks who have been tested. Um, so it's a very low number, but the curve is steep. So the folks there need to get out ahead of this as, as fast as they can. The orange color is where cases are doubling at a much slower rate. Uh, and the yellow color, and it's my, actually happens to be my home county of Monmouth, where they are doubling at yet again an even slower rate. There's another color that's better than yellow, uh, which basically means uh, you've, you've broken the back of it. I don't know what that color is, but I look forward to seeing it up there sooner than later. And then we could show you a national map, which we remind, remind you that we showed yesterday. And, and the, the deeper the, the red, uh, the more traveling there is going on, and the, the grayer the gray, the more social distancing and less travel that's going on. And we showed this to you yesterday. I don't think it's changed meaningfully in any way since yesterday. In fact, probably not at all. But the point is, the good news is you see New Jersey uh, among a cohort of very gray states, which means, folks, thank you. What you are doing is making a difference. And that ultimately will give us the best weapon we have to deal with this and break the back of that curve and flatten it. Uh, we still have a ways to go, by the way. I wish that this would be an, an overnight next week, two weeks from now phenomenon. It isn't. Uh, but you also can see why we are concerned about other places that are still traveling and have gotten to that stay at home status much more slowly than we have in New Jersey and our neighboring states. We're going to have to be very, very careful when we slowly, whenever it is, to begin to responsibly reopening our economy and our state and our society. We got to be very careful, particularly Judy and your team will remind me of contract, contact tracing uh, and being aggressive in quarantining and isolating anybody down the road. Once we've, listen, as I've said many times, we're going through hell together. Uh, I'll be darned if we're going to do that more than once. We got to make sure uh, this is going to be longer than any of us want, but we got to make sure that we not only crack the back of the reality here, but as we begin to open things up again, we don't inadvertently put gasoline back on the fire. And again, back to our communities of faith, regardless of your faith, we need you to remember that we are all in this together and that we must find ways to stay at home. We mandate stay at home and, and exercise your faith, practice your faith, social distance, even from your fellow family members, but at home. So I thank you for that. There are a number of different other uh, points which I'll make as quickly as I can before I turn things over to Judy. Uh, we've had a number of conversations at the most senior levels of the administration. Literally this morning, uh, I had a, a, a good conversation with Vice President Mike Pence across a whole range of critical asks uh, on our behalf. You won't be surprised. Ventilators was at the top of that conversation as it is in almost every conversation we have we have an outstanding remaining ask of 1650 from the feds we spoke about uh, in these conversations also with Jared Kushner with Admiral Jawa we spoke about uh, FEMA activities in the state we spoke about PPE as I mentioned ventilators um, I re expressed to the vice president how extraordinarily important it is that the Treasury Department be as flexible as they can be and as flexible as possible when they take the monies from the CARES Act that was signed last week and apply it to states. We're in a world of hurt. Not only are our expenses exploding, our revenues have fallen off the table, and that's in addition to what you all are going through as individuals, whether it's filing for unemployment or small businesses. 
uh, nonprofits. We hear from the arts community. We're all in a world of hurt, and I wanted to make sure that the vice president heard yet again that the more flexibility we apply to that, the better off we'll be. Again, uh, themes again repeated with Jared as it relates to ventilators and PPE in particular. Uh, we, we also went back and forth to make sure we had the flexibility we needed for those field medical stations, field hospitals as I call them, that are beginning to uh, populate themselves. Judy can give you an update on Secaucus. Um, so a whole range of conversations. Uh, Long-term care facilities is something Judy's going to hit. Um, and that's been a topic of other conversations that I know we've been having as a team. I was on with the Senate President last night and again this morning uh, on some particular concerns that he had. I just got off the phone as I was coming here with John Dolan, who heads the association. John reminds me that there are, we talk about 375 long care, long-term care facilities. There's another about 230 assisted living uh, properties. So there's really over 600 in the broader community. And I reiterated not only our thanks for their help, but also uh, a couple of things Judy's going to go over. The fact that we need all of the workers at these facilities who inadvertently may be bringing in the virus to be to be fully masked in their work, as we have, as Judy has, uh, has articulated already, um, that if there's any positive testing in, in, a, in a facility, it is the obligation, mandated obligation, of the operators of that facility to let next of kin know that that's happened, Judy, and I know you've stressed that. So that'll give you some sense of some of the conversations I was on with President Clinton this morning, talking about supply chain and just getting his advice and just brainstorming about other ways we may be able to get, get at shortages that we continue to have. Again, we continue to be short ventilators, PPE, beds, healthcare workers, which I know Judy will talk about, our heroes at the front lines. We're trying everything we can to stay out ahead of all the above. Um, but it, you know, is, I don't have to say this when you lose 200 people, um, not necessarily overnight, I say that, Judy, but this is a, another day where that 200 includes a, a lot of folks who did pass yesterday and this morning, but also folks that cumulatively have passed uh, recently. So God rest their souls. We're doing everything we can to keep the amount of folks, of lives we, we lose as low as possible uh, and separately. Um, uh, to keep the number of folks who get this virus as low as possible. As cases continue to surge, as we expect them to do, we are adding hospital capacity, as I mentioned, as quickly as we can, and under Judy's leadership and under Pat's leadership, and alongside the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, we're working with all of our hospitals to rapidly and significantly increase bed capacity. We are building out new wings and bringing vacated buildings back online, and we're building out our field medical stations, as I mentioned a minute ago, and expect to have our second location in Edison and ready, I believe, early next week, Pat, right? 14th, okay. Uh, we're also working to expand capacity by utilizing hotels and dormitories, particularly those located in hot spot areas or in close proximity to hospitals which are nearing capacity. This is an enormous effort to bring thousands of new beds online, which also requires us to plan for medical and administrative staffing, providing wraparound services, and meeting as I mentioned, our equipment and supply needs. At every level, this is a data-driven money ball process. We know where we expect our numbers to go in the coming weeks, and we have to do the difficult things to prepare for that. I will speak, I've sort of previewed this already the past couple of days, I and we will speak to this in more detail on Monday. Switching gears again, earlier this week, federal authorities broke up a significant PPE hoarding situation in Brooklyn and seized hundreds of thousands of pieces of PPE, precisely the equipment that is in short supply. Yesterday we learned from the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office that New Jersey will be one of the beneficiaries of the distribution of those hoarded supplies. We'll be receiving more than 70,000 N95 masks, as you can see, and 5,000 gloves, among other PPE from this seizure. I'd like to thank especially U.S. Attorney Craig Carpenito 
and Newark FBI Special Agent in Charge Greg Erie for their efforts in seeing that our frontline workers get this gear. And it gives me an opportunity to give a shout out to Jared Maples, who's with us, the Director of the Department of Homeland Security and Preparedness. Good to have you, Jared, with us as always. Today, Colonel Callahan will be signing an administrative order giving municipalities or counties the ability to prohibit all rentals to transient guests or seasonal tenants for the duration of this emergency, including at hotels and motels. We have heard too many stories, especially from our shore communities of people trying to relocate for the time being into their towns from impacted areas. This is not how social distancing works. No one should be leaving their primary residences and especially for the short communities that do not have the infrastructure, especially the health and first responder infrastructure in place, particularly off season, to accommodate uh, an influx of residents. Meanwhile, we are still seeing individuals and members of our business community stepping up to help our entire family get through this. Yesterday, by example, we were contacted by Uber Eats, the food delivery service, which is donating 14,000 meals, totaling $350,000 to frontline workers at four hospital systems across the state. We are incredibly grateful to them, and of course, we are incredibly grateful to the heroic workers who will be receiving these meals. And of course, we are still looking for many more people to join the thousands of retired or student health care workers and others with previous medical experience who have already signed up to volunteer to help us on the front lines. Please visit covid19.nj.gov slash volunteer. Again, covid19.nj.gov slash volunteer to add your name and to have your experience matched with our emergent needs. Judy uh, will likely address this, but it's fair to say with all the challenges we have on ventilators, where we're short, PPE where we're short, beds where we're short, in fact, in some cases, the gating factor is healthcare workers, right? Folks, because of folks who are not surprisingly out sick, social distancing, self-quarantining, uh, we need all the help we can get. So please keep raising your hand and, and, and add your name to the many thousands who have come forward and say they're willing to help. If I may switch gears again to the topic of testing, tomorrow, Sunday, April 5th, the Bergen Community College testing site, we will be operating uh, again in partnership with FEMA, will be open at 8 a.m. and that will remain open until it reaches its 500 test capacity. To be tested, you must be a New Jersey resident and you must be showing symptoms of a respiratory illness. Please, asymptomatic folks, I don't blame you for being worried, we understand that, but you gotta step aside and let the folks who are symptomatic uh, step forward and get tested. The PNC Bank Arts Center site, which today, I remind you, is serving only healthcare workers and first responders, will be closed to the general public tomorrow. And please remember, these are only two sites which are being operated directly through the Department of Health. There are many, many other county-run and other testing sites across the state. You can find one near you by visiting covid19.nj.gov slash testing. COVID 19.nj.gov slash testing. By last count, we had at least 45 separate testing sites across the state. And by the way, the number of tests that have been completed in the state has New Jersey with the 11th largest population in America, ranked number four in America, only behind New York, Florida, which have many more people than we do, and the state of Washington, where this all first evidenced itself. And if you believe you are showing symptoms, you can also take a self-assessment at covid19.nj.gov uh, and go on the symptoms page. In any case, if you feel sick, call your primary care practitioner to see if you meet the requirements for testing. Before I close, I'd like to take a moment to once again highlight and applaud some of the folks around our state who are truly living our Jersey values by helping their community. One of them is somebody I know, Gwen Love, the executive director of Lunch Break in Red Bank, in my county, Monmouth County. 
Gwen is keeping the doors there open to continue distributing meals and serving the needs of those across Monmouth County who need a helping hand, especially at this time. So to Gwen and her team, I say thank you. And how about this guy? This is Jim Hoffman. He's a science and technology educator at Newton High School in Sussex County, where he coaches, by the way, the robotics team. His son, Justin, is a resident doctor at University Hospital in Newark. Used to work for you, Judy. Uh, Jim is using, Jim the dad is using both his personal 3D printer and the two at Newton High School to produce protective face shields for the doctors and nurses who need them. So to Jim, we cannot thank you enough. Gwen and Jim are just two of what we know are thousands of ordinary New Jerseyans who are doing extraordinary things to help us pull through this emergency. Whether it's by keeping a community fed or making sure our frontline healthcare workers have the gear they need to stay safe on the job, or I should note the work of the many community pharmacists, another group I wanna give a big shout out to, who have kept their doors open to preserve their community's health and wellness. We have heroes up and down the state, beginning with our health care workers, our first responders, the community pharmacists I just mentioned, the folks who are working in essential retail, the NJ Transit bus and rail folks, the, the supply chain folks in warehouse, warehouses, the longshoremen I mentioned yesterday. The list is incredibly impressive and they are collectively our heroes and many more. We want to hear more stories like theirs, so please keep tweeting and using the hashtag NJThanksYou, and we'll keep sharing them. And please, everybody, please keep doing what you're doing to slow the spread and flatten the curve. That's also heroism. That's everyday heroism. And 100 years from now, when they write the memorials about what you did, that will be prominent among your life achievements, that you were there when we were needed the most. Keep up with your social distancing and keep staying indoors at home unless you absolutely need to go out or unless you are part of our frontline response in whichever way you are serving because we need you. Keep doing the little things, washing your hands with soap and water. Keep smart, keep remembering that we'll get through this and we'll get through this faster and stronger if we all do our parts. And before I introduce Judy, let's just all remember again, this is war. We are in a war. How do you win wars? You don't panic and you don't go business as usual. You win it by being smart, aggressive, proactive, shooting straight with each other, being honest about the toll that is both before us and will continue to grow. Let's not kid each other. You win wars by not turning on each other, but to the contrary, coming together, this extraordinary diverse state coming together as one family. You win a war because you work harder than the next folks. You win it because you show courage as we're seeing every single day up and down this state. From our frontline healthcare workers to every single one of the nine million of us, including folks right now at home by themselves doing exactly what we need them to do. Every single one of us is a hero right now. Every single one of us must do our part if we are to flatten the curve of this virus, allow our healthcare system to be able to deal with it properly and then emerge on the other side. And unequivocally, may I say, if we all do our part, there is no question in my mind, we will win this war and we will emerge from this stronger as one New Jersey family, more together than ever before. With that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor. Well, good afternoon. Yesterday, the CDC recommended the use of cloth face coverings in community settings to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. There is a growing body of evidence that asymptomatic or what they call pre-symptomatic individuals can actually spread the virus. So the CDC is recommending using a simple cloth face covering that covers the nose and the mouth. Cloth face coverings can be made at home from common materials like scarves or bandanas. And remember, a face covering, uh, lowering your chances of spreading the virus to others, it is not 
a fail-safe measure to prevent you from getting sick. Everyone can do their part to slow the spread of this virus. If you wear a mask, you are protecting others. And if others wear masks, they are protecting you. The cloth face coverings uh, recommended are not surgical masks. They are not medical grade N95 respirators. Those are critical supplies that must continue to be reserved for healthcare workers and other first responders who are caring for the sick. As the governor said yesterday, social distancing is by far our best preventative measure. Wearing a simple cloth face covering when you, you are out is not in any way a replacement for social distancing to flatten the curve. You must continue to keep at least six feet distance apart from others. Keep regularly washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Practice safe respiratory hygiene. And if you feel under the weather, even if you're convinced it's just your allergies acting up, stay indoors and away from others. I also want to return to another concern we talked about yesterday, the growing distress and fear of family members who have loved ones in long-term care settings. Family members have expressed growing concern about the lack of communication in some facilities when there is a resident who was confirmed with COVID-19. Families are frustrated that they believe they can't get someone on the phone in these facilities and they want to know if there is an outbreak in the facility in which their loved one has residence. On March 6th, our Deputy Commissioner, Marcella Maziars, sent a letter to all nursing homes, assisted living residences, comprehensive personal care homes, residential health care facilities, and dementia care homes, reminding them of their responsibility under the law to have an outbreak response plan, including clear policies for the notification of residents, residents' families, visitors, and staff when at least one COVID-19 case has been confirmed in a resident or a staff member at the facility. Today, I will be sending a follow-up notification to all long-term care facilities with specific guidance as to how to notify people. It must be in person and in writing to all residents. In person and in writing to all staff members. Notification via telephone, email, or other method of communication the facility is using to notify the resident's family member, guardian, or designated person during this time of restricted visitation must be followed up in writing within three days. This morning, I also spoke, as the governor did, to the CEO of the Long-Term uh, Care Association to, him, to inform him that we are not uh, uh, notified, that, that if we are not notified by the close of business on Monday that these directives are taking place, we will release the names of the long-term care facilities with at least one COVID-19 case. Regarding our hospitals in the northern part of the state, we predicted that we would see a surge beginning the mid-second mid week of April, going through the end of April and into May. However, we believe that part of that surge is just starting. Last night, we had nine hospitals on divert, primarily due to staffing issues and critical care bed capacity. Three hospitals were on divert for critical care. Six on full divert, primarily due to staff issues. We need volunteers. We need volunteers to assist us in this effort. If you can volunteer, please visit covid19.nj.gov slash volunteer to sign up. We are sending out today a crisis alert for more volunteers. If you can volunteer, again, please visit covid19.nj.gov slash volunteer to sign up. We need you. 
our hospitals are reporting over 4,000 confirmed positive COVID patients in our hospitals as of last evening. And an additional over 2,000 PURs or persons under investigations awaiting test results. 1,494 of those patients of confirmed positive are in critical care and over 85% or 1,263 are on ventilators. Also, our first field medical station in Secaucus will open on Monday. This morning, as we speak, there, was, there is a training session being held for individuals who are volunteering to, be, to staff that site. As the governor mentioned, we are reporting 4,331 new cases for a total of 34,124 cases in this state that will continue to grow. We need the volunteers. We need the field operation to be up and running. Again, sadly, 200 new deaths have been reported. Of the new deaths reported, 47 were from Bergen County, 37 from Essex, 21 from Ocean, 8 each from Mercer and Mars, 6 from Monmouth, 4 from Passaic, 3 from Warren, and 1 each from Burlington, Camden, Cumberland, Hunterdon, Somerset, and Sussex. Nine of these new deaths were residents of long-term care facilities. So we now have 846 fatalities in our state. We, all, we join with the governor and offer condolences to the families who have lost loved ones. The county breakdown of new cases is as follows. Atlantic, 28. Bergen, 607. Burlington, 98. Camden, 74. Cape May, 7. Cumberland, 5. Essex, 409. Gloucester, 31. Hudson, 494. 123. Mercer, 89. Middlesex, 400. Monmouth, 301. Morris, 214. Ocean, 268. Passaic, 489. Nunn in Salem. Somerset, 108. Sussex, 21. Union, 287. And Warren, 30. And we are still gathering more details on 348 of these new cases. At this point, 148 long-term care facilities in the state are reporting at least one COVID-19 case. And as the governor shared, we have 375 nursing, long-term care nursing facilities and approximately 200 assisted living facilities and other settings such as residential memory care housing. I do wanna share the breakdown of the 846 reported fatalities. 61% are male, 39% are female. As far as the age range, uh, there are six cases or 1% under the age of 30. 47 or 6% between 30 and 49. 16% or 136 between the ages of 50 and 64. 32% or 268 individuals between the ages of 65 and 79 and 46%, 389 over the age of 80. We have documented underlying health conditions for 300 of our cases at this point, or 35%. We have four cases identified of, as not having an underlying health condition, F only four. Otherwise, we have 542 still under investigation, so we expect those with underlying health conditions to increase. And again, about 9% associated with long-term care. So you may not feel sick, but it is possible that you could transmit COVID-19 to someone more vulnerable. We ask you to be careful. We ask you to follow the CDC guidelines when you leave your residence.
For more information, I encourage you to call NJ211 or visit covid19.nj.gov. They're great resources for the public to get information. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, for that and for all. A couple of points, if I may follow up, um, Judy, with you. Again, top five counties are staying about the same in terms of positive cases. I'll just read them in order. Bergen continue, number one. Essex, number two. Hudson, three. Union, four. Passaic, five. So it's that same cluster of the northeast uh, counties. Again, Judy, cloth face covering is the recommendation from the CDC. And to dovetail that with, um, and by the way, that's something that I'll speak for all of us that we'll all take seriously. It's hard to, to do a press conference with a face mask or a face covering, uh, and we're staying six feet apart, and, and we will make sure of that. But that's advice that we're not only giving to people via the CDC, uh, but we'll take their advice ourselves. But importantly, cloth face covering is not a face mask necessarily and certainly it isn't a surgical or an N95. And I would just beg people, do not, I'm begging you, don't go out and, and have a, a run on the very masks that our healthcare workers, first responders, and by the way, they don't even have enough, never mind expanding it out to the other categories of folks that we want to expand it to, essential retail, NJ Transit, et cetera, et cetera. Did I get that right? Um, so again, uh, don't, don't, please don't compound a challenge that we already have. Um, bear with me. Uh, the notification on long-term term care facilities, I just want to repeat, we mean business on that, right? If, if, they, if, they, if, if the facilities don't do the proper communication by Monday, we will communicate directly to you in this forum or in some other forum ourselves. Is that fair to say? Um, so we mean business on that front. Cannot say that enough on volunteers. Please go to the main um, website, covid19.nj.gov slash volunteer because uh, goodness knows we need you. And I saw a great picture of the very group of volunteers today in Secaucus going through their, their training, and it was really heartening to see. That's going to really be up modest at first, but it's going to be up and open for business on Monday. It's an extraordinary feat in terms of getting it up and running and now getting it staffed, and very soon, within a couple of days, being able to handle handle patients. So hats off, and obviously Edison and Atlantic City not too far behind. Before we hear from Rob, thank you, Judy, for everything. Before we hear from Rob, anything, Pat, on the compliance, PPE, bed construction, or other topics? Just thank you, Governor. Just one correction. Uh, I had Atlantic City and Edison confused. Uh, the Edison Field Medical Station is almost, uh, is about 75% complete. That should be ready by April 8th, not the 14th. It is the Atlantic City Convention Center that the target date is April 14th. I so, just wanted to clarify that. So that's that. Secaucus open for patients on Monday, again, slowly but surely. Uh, on Wednesday, Edison uh, likely to be in the shape that you and I saw Secaucus as of last Thursday. Yes, sir. And then it will be a week from Tuesday for Atlantic City. Uh, that, that's that, correct. Got that? Perfect. Uh, as far as the overnight, uh, really generally quiet. There is a subject charge with the executive order violation for uh, facilitating and pulling together a youth basketball game with six juveniles. Uh, he was cited. There was a subject arrested uh, for domestic violence and brought to the Monmouth County Jail in Freehold where during his processing he claimed to have the coronavirus and spit on the officers trying to process him. Uh, and once again, Newark uh, last night issued 122 summonses and closed seven businesses. Uh, I did speak with Director Ambrose this morning to thank him for his uh, continued efforts and to offer our condolences on the loss of Officer Tolbert Furr, who did pass away as a result of COVID-19. Thank you, Governor. God rest his soul um, and all the others whose lives are lost. The knucklehead hall of shame uh, just astounds me that somebody would do that, what that, that guy did in, in Monmouth. So again, folks, the great news is overwhelmingly everybody in New Jersey is doing exactly what we need you to do. Uh, but we need everybody to do that. And so please, no gatherings, uh, no stupid behavior, certainly. Uh, but please, everybody, stay 
at home. So clearly this is a time of hurt for so many. Uh, look at the lives lost, the precious souls, their families and friends and communities, the folks who are dealing with COVID-19 right now as we speak. Um, but let's also remember at the top of the list is a historic amount of people who have lost their jobs in this state and in this country at levels that are literally, Rob, I said yesterday, tens of fold, tens times, tens of times more than uh, any normal period and even relative to other spikes in our past. Um, and I know there's a lot of folks out there who are clamoring and who could blame you to get that security of having the connection made, whether it's online, whether it's on the telephone, that you know you're going to get the unemployment insurance and the great news coming out of the bill that was signed by the president a week ago yesterday. There's now more federal help, uh, and, and that's a big deal. And, and I've said before, and I'll say it again as I introduce Rob, everybody please bear with us. They've got some extraordinary folks led by this guy and his team are doing everything they can to answer your calls and to respond and to make sure you get that comfort you need. Um, just know that it's an unprecedented level and you won't lose one penny of support if it takes a little bit longer, I promise you that. So with that, the leader of an extraordinary group of folks who are doing everything they can, please help me welcome the Commissioner of the Department of Labor and Workforce Development, Rob Acero Angelo. Thank you, Governor, uh, for having me this afternoon, uh, and thank you for the shout out to James Hoffman and the Newton Robotics team. I've seen Aperture perform a couple times, and they are no joke. Uh, Judy, Pat, uh, thank you so much for your strong and stable leadership uh, during these times. I really appreciate it as your colleague and New Jersey resident. Over the prior two weeks, we saw more than 362,000 people apply for unemployment as a result of this public health emergency. The crush of layoffs and furloughs have overwhelmed state unemployment agencies nationwide, and New Jersey is no exception. We are seeing volume of claims to our website and calls to our customer service centers ex exponentially higher than any time in history. I don't like correcting uh, the boss who said we had tens times increasing claims, uh, but the first week of the crisis we saw a 1,600% increase in volume, 1,600% in a single week. But I'm not here to talk about the strain our system has been under the last few weeks. I'm here to talk about what's really important, our action plan to serve the public at this difficult time. There's nothing I want more than to put your hard-earned benefits into your family budget sooner. We've made no secret about the inflexibilities of our legacy technology and our desperate desire to receive and act on more of your phone calls. We hear your frustration and we are with you. We're currently working to bring into our systems more of your calls and emails. This is our number one priority. We hear it from family, our own family members, friends, friends of friends, all making similar pleas for help as this pandemic has impacted everyone. As one New Jersey family, we've been affected together, and I'm confident we will get through this together. I want to thank my colleague, Chris Ryan, at the Office of Information Technology, and our own IT staff, led by Sharon Pagano, who have been working nonstop to make our 40-year-old mainframe systems continue to perform under such atypical circumstances, and all of our UI division, led by Greg Castellani, who have become economic first responders for much of our state. We are moving aggressively. Here is what we have done and what we are doing to better serve our customers. We're increasing capacity to ensure more calls and more applications get through at one time. In recent years, we've incorporated pocket solutions and changes to our unemployment systems that have allowed 92% of claims to come in online, taking stress off of our phone lines. By comparison, after Superstorm Sandy, peak of online filing was just 70%. I mean, talking about the numbers we're talking about, that's a big difference. We're pinpointing places where claims are getting stuck and using all the department's resources to reroute those claims so we can pay them as soon as possible. We're adding phone lines and have trained employees from other divisions to help us field calls. We have procured hundreds of additional laptops so more staff can work remotely. We're continuously updating our website, adding information in easy, plain language to walk our customers through the application process. We know this is new for a lot of people, so we're trying to make our clunky, old applications as user-friendly as possible. nj.gov slash labor and myunemployment.nj.gov provide great resources for first-time filers, including FAQs. We have put out helpful guides so our customers can feel secure they're applying for the right program, which also speeds their processing. 
We're working to make sure our customers have the information they need from us to understand what is happening every step of the way so they won't have to worry about their benefit application, their benefit amount, or waste time trying to get through on the phone. We have our staff working overtime, late hours, and on weekends to move claims along that need an agent's review. The number of new unemployment claims moving through without issue is about 50 percent, which is no different than before the pandemic. That means half the residents who file for unemployment begin receiving benefits within two or three weeks. When filing online, there are reasons a claim might not be processed immediately and need one of our claims examiners to review it. A person may be filing for the first time and did not provide all the required information or already had an old account in the system. A person may be temporarily furloughed, so they may feel confused about the, work search, the federally mandated work search questions on the unemployment application, or they are independent contractors who have been told to apply while we await federal guidelines on how to administer benefits to this unique population. These are not uncommon issues for our staff, but they do require verifying important information and walking through the process with claimants one at a time. Imagine a stadium with 10,000 seats, but there are a million people waiting to get in. There are only so many who can get through the gates at one time. To help reduce the number of claims that do need agent intervention, just last night, maybe it was early this morning, we posted a brand new FAQ with 45 additional COVID-specific filing questions. I can't stress enough how much we empathize with the frustration, fear, and economic uncertainty that comes with suddenly being unemployed. Due to the high volume of claims being filed, there may be a delay in processing the back date, but they will be paid for each week they are eligible for benefits, no matter when the claim gets processed. We also suggest applying online during off hours, such as first thing in the morning or later in the evening when traffic is lightest. We recognize this is small consolation while the, when the bills are due today, but we are working on getting you help as fast as we can. This is why we're also grateful for the additional support the federal government and the NGA, NJEDA are providing to businesses in the forms of grants, loans, and payroll tax credits for keeping employees on the payroll that my colleague Tim Sullivan talked about here yesterday. The Federal CARES Act, the Governor mentioned, signed last Friday night, will bring direct relief to our workers by expanding unemployment eligibility and providing an additional $600 per week for four months, on top of what state programs pay. And it also will open up benefits to those who are not traditionally eligible, such as the self-employed and independent contractors. However, we still have to wait for federal guidance before this can begin, but relief is coming. This week that ends today is the first week claimants are eligible for this additional $600 benefit, and New Jersey residents will receive this just a few days after they receive their regular unemployment check next week. They do not have to do anything else to get this additional funding. We are awaiting guidance from the U.S. Department of Labor on how and when to administer the 13-week extension of unemployment benefits known as pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, but we will share this information far and wide as soon as we have it. In closing, I want everybody watching to know that our department is working harder than ever before to address the hardships many of you are facing due to this pandemic. Our staff is in our office or at home working remotely right now because this is the biggest emergency our department has ever and hopefully will ever face. I join in the governor's sentiments that together we'll not only beat this unprecedented threat to our health and welfare, but we will emerge on the other side a stronger and more united New Jersey. Our workers and businesses have paid into the system precisely for this moment, and now it's here for you. We will get every one of you, our fellow New Jerseyans, the help they deserve. Thank you, Governor. Rob, thank you, and thank you for your leadership uh, every day, but certainly these days. You know, Rob, Rob has got deep, uh, first of all, he's an organized labor family guy. Secondly, he has deep state experience. Clearly, he's leading our efforts, but also had federal experience under Secretary Perez uh, in the Obama administration. And for all those reasons, we're incredibly honored and glad to have you at the helm, particularly during this crisis. Um, this will be of no solace to somebody who's trying to get through, and I'm not intending it to be any solace. But as we look at other states and compare notes, which we do all the time, uh, I'd say we're in a, a meaningfully, again, it doesn't, not, not going to make you feel any better. We're in a better position than most of the folks that we're talking to. Uh, so this is, we're all in this together. The numbers are ginormous relative to anything we've ever dealt with historically and certainly relative to um, 
any norm. And secondly, in our list of volunteers, Judy, not only do we need healthcare workers, but given the legacy systems, we should add a page for cobalt uh, uh, computer skills, because that's what we're dealing with uh, uh, in these legacies. Uh, uh, Chris Ryan's doing a heck of a job, but literally, uh, we, we have uh, systems that are 40 plus years old, uh, and there'll be, enough, there'll be lots of postmortems, and one of them on our list will be how the heck did we get here when we literally needed cobalt programmers. Uh, so thank you, Rob, and thanks to each and everyone. We're going to start over here. We're going to try to go at a pretty good pace today. Brett, we'll start with you. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, good afternoon. So um, Brendan's got one... the microphone. That's Brendan. He's with you. Oh, no problem. Hi, Brennan. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, Colonel, do you have any more information on where that basketball game was? And it was six people who were in I'm juveniles? So, yeah, I'm sorry. That was in Raritan Township. It was a... Uh, County? In, uh, yes. And it was just, um, again, a, a gentleman organizing a game uh, of six juveniles. Okay. Uh, and then... Uh, more pre pressingly, uh, some corrections officers don't believe they're being offered enough protection behind bars, and they've raised concerns about a lack of PPE and flagged reports that inmates are still being transferred between facilities in the northern and southern parts of the state. Uh, some unions have asked you, uh, the governor, to, to lock down state prisons and all transfers. Um, are you open to either of those requests? Um, then two more uh, from Dan Munoz of NJ Biz. Can you ask, uh, can I ask, which dorms and hotels are being used for patients? And this trans, this is another question I have, these tra this transient order, does that mean all hotels and motels across the state are being asked not to accept people anymore and are now going to be used for hospital space? And then uh, last one, this is from my colleague Sue Livio. Um, you issued guidance this week that described when a sick healthcare worker is allowed back to work. The guidance is based on CDC guidance, but it doesn't include one important aspect the CDC included, which allows the guidance to be set aside if there is a staffing shortage. We sorry, hear hospitals set aside what? Sorry, set aside a staffing, uh, which which allows guidance to be set aside if there is a staffing staffing shortage. We hear hospitals are following the CDC language of bringing sick workers back before they recover. Did you leave this uh, loophole out intentionally? And what do you want the hospitals? to do. Okay, a number of things. Um, uh, is Daniel well, by the way? Is Daniel's... Yeah, I think he's just not, yeah, I, okay. I think he's fine. I just think tell, tell everyone who's given you these, and I know some of others have fielded their questions. Tell them yeah. where uh, we said, hey, we're thinking of them. Uh, so we've got corrections officers who don't have enough PPE. Uh, I don't think there's any category in this state that has enough PPE. I could say definitively. Uh, so that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean we're not taking it seriously, uh, but that is a fact. That Judy can t comment on corrections in a minute because you, in fact, have been back and forth a lot with Marcus Hicks, our commissioner. Uh, dorms and hotels with a priority, Pat, near hospitals. That's, uh, am I right? That's correct. And we've, it's a daily discussion. Uh, we're trying to, at this juncture, those dorms and hotels are for the medical staffing. We're trying to have them close to not only uh, the Secaucus Field Medical Station. Uh, I think that we're talking about Rutgers in New Brunswick, as well as Rutgers in Newark. That's right in close proximity to St. Michael's. So to try and get those hotels slash dorms uh, at first glance to, to house the medical staff. So we don't, you know, so we have them in close proximity to where we need them. The, the administrative order that you're going to sign, I just want a little more detail on that. What exactly does that do? I think it's, it is a combination. I think to the, I think the governor made the point, we don't want people traveling down there. I don't think at this juncture that those uh, smaller hotels, but I, I certainly would defer to Matt Platkin, who's standing in the back there with regards to... So uh, that. No, hold on. Let, let, bear with us. Bear with us. Let, me, let's hit, let, let okay. me hit Judy corrections. Then I want to come back and, and ask Matt to talk about both the, the st staffing shortage question. This has been a special report from CBS2 News.